So, welcome everybody to the second seminar of uh, LSEC weekly seminars. Uh, today we are honored to host Professor Robert Fromke from NYU. Before I start, a few instructions about the format. During the talk, you are going to be in mute mode. If you wish to ask a question, and we encourage you to do so, especially students in the audience, please unmute yourself by pressing the microphone icon at the left bottom corner of the Zoom screen. Uh, we'll also have time for, the, for a question at the end of the talk. We, are, of course, will start a question at the end of the talk with students, followed by questions from faculty and guests. So let's begin. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Fomke from NYU. Robert did his undergraduate in computer science at Tuft University. He later did his PhD with Yang Dan at Berkeley, where he studied spike time independent plasticity in cortical networks. And then he did a postdoc with Mike Mezenich and Christoph uh, Schreiner at UCSF on how synaptic plasticity shapes auditory perception and behavior. His current scientific work at NYU focuses on the following directions. The first being the circuit dynamics and plasticity and how they relate to the control of social behavior, such as maternal behavior in mice, with particular emphasis on oxytocin. His work in this direction provides some of the first direct evidence that oxytocin increases the salience of incoming sensory inputs by reducing synaptic inhibition in the cortex. He also studies how cortical plasticity, plasticity shapes auditory perception and mechanism of excitatory inhibitory balance in cortical circuits. So let's welcome Robert. Robert, the screen is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be talking to you all today. Um, and so uh, my seminar today will focus on both of the things that David mentioned uh, with an emphasis on oxytocin. Uh, and so here's a, a brief outline of my talk today. Uh, the first two thirds or so will be published work um, largely by three graduate students uh, talking about how oxytocin helps really turn on a form of mouse maternal behavior, puppet retrieval. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our efforts to work on the oxytocin circuitry of the mouse brain, and then talk a lot about uh, responses um, to pup call sounds and how oxytocin might modulate these, these responses. And this is the work of graduate students Bianca Marlin, who's now opening her own lab at Columbia, Mary Ellen Mitra, who is now in residency at Cornell Medical, and Jen Schiavo, who is starting a postdoc at Columbia. And then in the final 10 minutes or so of my talk, I'll be talking about some newer work, um, which we're basically trying to make documentary uh, films of the, the social life of a mouse, um, uh, at least for a week or so, as she gains kind of new parental experience, while we record directly from oxytocin neurons, to try to understand what activates the oxytocin system, what's the receptive field of an oxytocin neuron. And this is the work that was uh, spearheaded by a former postdoc in the lab, Iwana Karsha, who now has her own lab at Rutgers. Uh, but, but first, how do these two parts of, of the lab kind of fit together? How do we begin working on oxytocin in the first place? Uh, well, my lab has been consistently focused on plasticity, even from my, my graduate days. Um, and it's not that things like long-term potentiation, LTP, are actually all that uh, difficult to induce. There are all kinds of different ways you can change synaptic strength. Uh, here are three of the, the, the major ways. Uh, just by high frequency stimulation, tetanizing, say, the chamfer collateral uh, or perforant path, uh, you can potentiate hippocampal synapses. Um, this is the, the landmark work of um, Bliss and Lomo uh, in the hippocampal. In the hippocampus. Uh, of course, pairing pre and post synaptic action potentials. Uh, just by changing spike timing, you can also induce long term potentiation or long term depression. Um, the work of Mooming Poo, uh, Henry Markram, Bert Sackman, and others from 20 years ago. And then also, you can just wash on uh, lots of different uh, neuroactive chemicals uh, carbacol, uh, glutamate, high potassium. And that will also boost synaptic strength. The question really is when do any of these mechanisms, when are they engaged in real life? It, it really could be that. You know, increases in extracellular potassium concentration do occur at some point. Um, we just really don't know when those experiences happen to be that relate to specific forms of long-term plasticity induction. And it's not just changes in local activity that, that are important, 
Long range signals, contextual and remonstrance signals are also important for these processes. Uh, this is a figure from Eve Martyr's work. Uh, Eve has really been a leader in the field thinking about neuromodulation for decades. This is a schematic of the, the crab somatic, uh, gastric ganglion, the crab stomach, in which essentially all of the neurons and all the connectivity is fully known. We have the wiring diagram. Um, and what's listed here are, are uh, many of the neuroactive uh, compounds, peptides, modulators, and, and such, that have been found to regulate the rhythm of crab digestion. And one of the points of Eve's work is that even though we have the connectome, even though we have essentially a long parts list of the neuromodulators, we still don't understand the full dynamics by which um, crabs uh, digest their food under different states. And so if it still remains uh, complicated in the crab stomach, what does that mean, for example, in the cortex? And then finally, if we're interested in relating synaptic changes to learning and memory, well, then uh, it'd be nice if we could work on behavioral systems. Uh, they're kind of amenable to that approach that are sort of rapidly induced with robust behaviors and that involve learning as we might kind of more intuitively understand it, right? Bonafide learning involves abstraction, generalization, inference. It's not just stimulus response associations and a big lookup table. Uh, there's, there's some kind of generalization that needs to be captured if we really are to learn something. And so for all these reasons, we, we've worked on uh, uh, the response, maternal responses to pup call silence, in part also largely inspired by the work of, of Adi Mizrahi there. Uh, but um, this is just, uh, this is the long answer to the question as to how we got into oxytocin. Here's the, the short answer, which is uh, um, exemplified by this YouTube movie I want to show you. And I borrowed this from a colleague of mine who used to watch this. Uh, he told me, uh, for example, Monday morning, when he woke up and had to start work or he got grant reviews back or something. This movie is called Four Laughing Babies. Let's see if you can hear the sound here. One, two, three, four. <laughs> that play, you all heard a bunch of babies laugh. Uh, so, um, you know, our lives as social individuals uh, uh, it's basically about this, right? Trying to get people that we, we uh, love or want to like us to have a nice time and to laugh at our jokes. Uh, but of course, having babies isn't all fun and games. Uh, I'm a, a fairly new parent myself. Um, this is another uh, baby from YouTube, one crying baby. This is not my, not my wife, not my child. Um, but I want you to watch what the mother does. You can see the infant is crying and the mother tries to feed the child. But that doesn't seem to work. Uh, the infant keeps crying. Then maybe it's nap time or there's something else that the, the infant needs. The point here is that infants have a limited repertoire of signals they can use to tell us what they need from us. Uh, they can't just say that they're hungry. They have to, they, they really can just cry. And as parents, we have to quickly infer the need of the child and provide it essentially with 100% reliability to ensure survival of offspring and species. And it's not just uh, human moms and dads have to do this. Animal mothers and fathers have to do this too. And if there's one thing we've really learned about the biology of parenting and maternity, it's that the uh, neurohormone oxytocin is critically involved in a lot of aspects here. So oxytocin is an nine amino acid peptide. It's synthesized almost exclusively in various nuclei of the hypothalamus, largely the paraventricular nucleus, the PVN, and the superoptic nucleus. Most of these projections go into the posterior pituitary, which is really just a bag of axon terminals that release oxytocin uh, for its famous action for milk ejection and for parturition, for inducing contractions for birthing. Um, and there's uh, one receptor for oxytocin in the genome, it's, and it's, it's quite amazing. If you knock out either the oxytocin receptor or oxytocin peptide, uh, mice cannot feed their young, there's no milk ejection reflex, and the pups will die. There's no redundancy in the system, and so quite literally, oxytocin is one of the things that makes us mammals. Uh, to be clear, oxytocin is not oxycontin. Oxycontin is a, basically a, a low-grade form of morphine. It's a painkiller. Uh, please be careful with it. Um, oxytocin, however, is pitocin. It's the same thing. Pitocin is uh, given really ad lib dur during and after pregnancy for postpartum care. Uh, 
Octopofin is made in the lab. Octopofin proper is made in the brain. That's the same nine amino acids um, uh, in both cases. There's a kind of an interesting growing literature um, giving octopofin often intranasally to human subjects. Um, and there are claims that um, intranasal oxytocin can increase pro-social behavior, trust and generosity, uh, even in uh, people who might be uh, somewhere on the autism spectrum. And if that's the case, that's amazing. And we need to figure out just how oxytocin is acting in the brain to eventually provide this kind of uh, therapeutic treatment. Um, but if there is one thing we do know about central effects of oxytocin, this really stems from the work of a lot of people, uh, Sue Carter, uh, Court Peterson, um, Larry Young, and Tom Insel. It's that oxytocin infused into the brain can really turn on or enable uh, a broad range of maternal behaviors in rodents. And one of these is pup retrieval. I'll show you a movie in the next slide, but here's a cartoon. Uh, basically, um, mice are prey species, right? They have to move their nests around in the wild to escape predation. And the pups are born blind and deaf. They don't really move for the first uh, week or two of life. The way the pups move with the mothers is they attach onto them and they get dragged with the mothers wherever they go. Pups might fall off. And if the pup is then isolated from the caretaker, it changes the ultrasonic vocalizations that these animals are sort of always making when they're awake. They shift up to the high ultrasound spectrum. They're emitted at a characteristic bout rate of around five hertz, plus or minus. And the mother animal uses the sound of this baby crying to go find the pup and take it back to the nest. Um, here, and we can study this in the lab. Uh, here's a movie where we've just pulled a pup out of the nest. This is the mother back in the nest. We use ultrasonic microphones to verify the pups do indeed make vocalizations. And you can see with short latency, the mother goes, picks up the pup. I want to play this again. And what I'd like you to focus on so the mother animal seems to understand or know the physics of the pup, precisely where to pick it up, how much force to use, to overcome gravity without hurting the animal, picking it up from the scruff of the neck. And so uh, it's, it's unlikely at least that all of this is sort of fully innate and hardwired into the genome. There have to be at least motor components by which the animals have learned how to manipulate pups. And one of the questions really driving our research is on the auditory side, how much of this is intrinsic versus how much of learned from experience. Because there certainly is some element of, of learning that, that might occur. Um, virgin females who uh, do not have much experience in pups, they don't retrieve animals in the same way. They might investigate the, the pup as a source of novel sound generation, but you can see they're neglectful. They basically just ignore the pup. Um, but we've known for a, a while as a field that exposure to pups will induce maternal behaviors in virgin females with the exception of lactation. Um, and the presence of the mother animal might infect that in some way. And so the first experiments that we did uh, involved taking virgin animals, putting them in the cage with a mother and her pups, and then testing the virgin's retrieval after periods of exposure ranging from uh, one hour to uh, you know, three days or, or even longer. And some animals are treated with saline as controls other animals are treated with oxytocin, either pharmacologically or using optogenetics. Okay, here's our uh, assessment of pup retrieval in one of these co-housed virgins. This is a retrieval success on the y-axis, tested in just the same way I showed you, 10 or 20 trials over about half an hour or so at these time points indicated by the dots. Time zero is the beginning of co-housing. She's been co-housed for three days and she's been given saline injections uh, during the testing period. And you can see nothing happens for the first day. She's retrieving at 0%. And then something special happens. Now on day two, she's retrieving with 100% reliability. About half the animals begin retrieving over about a three-day period. Here's a different animal given systemic oxytocin. She's retrieving at a much earlier time point. Animals given oxytocin, about half of them retrieve really as early as we can begin to measure within the first hour or so. About 80% of them uh, begin to retrieve over a three-day period. Um, when I started my lab, uh, Brad Lowell had just produced uh, uh, important Cree lines, uh, oxytocin Cree animals, and so we used those animals to express channel adoption in the oxytocin neurons, and then in the first studies here, we implanted optical fiber down over the PVN to release endogenous oxytocin uh, potentially throughout the whole brain. 
And we do optical stimulation, not continuously for the three-day co-housing period, really just during the, the 20 minute testing period. And you can see that this animal receiving, receiving optogenic stimulation, this virgin also retrieved at a much earlier time point than saline counterparts. About seven out of eight animals retrieved within the first day or so who have been optogenically stimulated in this way. So then the question is, how is oxytocin acting and where is it acting um, to maybe help uh, turn on these behaviors? So I'm gonna summarize a, a, a lot of work that we and others have been doing. Um, Ballard Grinovich, Ron Stoop, and their colleagues also have taken a, a, a lot of effort to map projections out of the oxytocin neurons, and projections to the oxytocin system. We essentially find oxytocin positive axons in every bit of brain area that we've looked at, often with low abundance, but the axons are definitely there. Um, what about receptors for oxytocin? Well, there's, like I mentioned, there's one receptor for oxytocin in the genome, but it's a GPCR with a lot of homology to the basal pressing receptor family. And so there hadn't been a good antibody for the mouse oxytocin receptor. So in collaboration with Moses Chow's lab, who has experience making antibodies to GPCRs, we took a few years and made uh, a nice, clean, specific antibody for the mouse oxytocin receptor. Here's tissue from a wild type of virgin female auditory cortex, the six layers of cortex down the side here. DAPI is our counter stain for cell number. Uh, we tried uh, several different epitopes. The second one, OXTR2, was the most specific. Here is our antibody staining with OXTR2 in red. Uh, many cells in wild type tissue are stained. No cells are stained in oxytocin receptor knockout animals. We then uh, characterized receptor expression throughout the brain. Uh, we've also been doing it throughout the entire organism, which I'm not going to show today. Um, and there are interesting differences in the patterns of receptor expression between males and females, uh, sometimes between mothers and non mothers. Uh, but one unusual hot spot was in female left auditory cortex. Here's tissue from the left auditory cortex and the right auditory cortex of the same virgin female. And about 40% more cells express oxytocin receptors on the left side than on the right side. Um, about 20% or so on the left cortex, um, about 10% or so in the right auditory cortex. And with an antibody, we can go a little bit further and ask who are these cells expressing receptors in the cortex? Uh, similar to work by Nat Hines using back transgenic animals, we find that most of the cells expressing the receptors in cortex are inhibitory interneurons. About 70% of the, of the oxytocin receptor positive cells are interneurons of either parvalbumin positive or somatostatin positive flavor. The other 30% of the cells are essentially everything else, including pyramidal cells and some glial cells. And uh, consistent with that, in some work with uh, Chia Yoki at NYU, looking at uh, electron micrographs to figure out where in the cells the receptors are located, we see receptors sort of here and there in glial processes and dendrites and axons. One interesting place that we located oxytocin receptors was at inhibitory synapses. Here's a GABAergic terminal she identified onto a postsynaptic excitatory cell. And so the oxytocin receptors are poised, ready to modulate intracortical inhibition. And along those lines, if we cut brain slices of mouse auditory cortex, this is the left auditory cortex, where we've patched onto a layer five pyramidal cell here in the brain slice. If we just shock the tissue, with an extracellular electrode to evoke uh, EPSCs and IPSCs. We see there's uh, almost no direct modulation of the EPSC itself. There is a form of long-term plasticity of the EPSC I'll, I'll get to, but there's no direct effect on the EPSCs per se of oxytocin. Instead, oxytocin seems to downregulate the strength of evoked inhibition. Here, if we wash on oxytocin in wild-type slices, there's a decrease in the evoked IPSC amplitude. And if we cut slices from our animals with channel rhodopsin in the oxytocin fibers and shine blue light over the slice, we also see a reduction in the amplitude of the evoked IPSC. And similar to work from Dick Chen's lab in the Shepherd collaterals, where if they use the oxytocin receptor agonist TGOT, there is a specific reduction of IPSC strength, no change in the EPSC. So, um, and what's so special about auditory cortex for oxytocin signaling and pup call sounds? Um, 
Well, here's a schematic of the mammalian auditory system. Uh, the cochlea is down here. Here's the brainstem, midbrain, thalamus, and cortex. Um, even though there's a whole lot of machinery between the ear and cortex, we think that a lot of this, the, the low level subcortical machinery uh, of circuitry is processing features, acoustic features of sounds, like where sounds are in space, uh, how loud they are, what their frequencies are. But that cortex might be doing something a, a bit different. Um, it might be attaching behavioral meaning to sounds based on experience. And so we then asked, is auditory cortex required for pup retrieval um, by doing essentially a loss of function and then a, a gain of function experiment? Uh, here, uh, we've taken experienced retrieving animals, usually mums, and we put a cannula either left auditory cortex or right auditory cortex. And then we infuse the GABA agonist moose mall into, into the auditory cortex unilaterally, to ask about left versus right uh, uh, hemisphere activation. Uh, for responding to pup call sounds. Okay, here's a movie of a mother with a cannula over left auditory cortex. Um, this is before you put moose mall in. This is just a, a day one. And you can see that even though she has a cannula in the left auditory cortex, she has no problem retrieving. And then the next day, it's the same animal. We put it, we come in and put moose mall in left auditory cortex. And you can see here instead, even though she's come out to investigate the pup, the pup is indeed calling, making vocalizations. The animal no longer seems to recognize the behavioral meaning of these calls. And in the end, she just sort of walks off. So she's not impaired in terms of her gross motor abilities. She really seems to be uh, no longer understanding of the behavioral uh, importance of these pup call sounds. And so these are the results of left auditory cortex inactivations of Moosemol. Under baseline conditions, the animals retrieve uh, just fine. With Moosemol, about one third are impaired one third are okay and one third crash completely. And the next day if we come in and put saline in those animals, they're back up uh, retrieving just fine. Pup retrieval abilities seem to be also left lateralized in auditory cortex because if we put moose mall in the right auditory cortex, there's no effect in four out of five animals. And uh, this is consistent with earlier work from Gunter Eretz's lab. Uh, Gunter is one of the, the grandfathers of this whole field been recording and synthesizing pup vocalizations uh, dating back to the, the 70s and 80s. Um, I like showing this figure uh, from one of Gunter's papers. This is a, the only figure in the paper. It's a single bar graph published in Nature in 1987. Um, look at the ends here, hundreds of animals that Gunter has tested on a tea maze, where one arm of the maze is playing infant distress calls. The other arm of the maze is playing similar sounds or then scrambled a little bit, but they're, they're definitely different than, than canonical pup calls. And then mothers are fitted with either a left ear plug or a right ear plug. And animals who are given a right ear plug here in R, they're performing basically a chance in terms of what arm of the tea maze they go to. So there's a right ear, left hemisphere advantage for responding to the sounds of conspecifics. Uh, well, what if we just uh, push on the oxytocin system in left auditory cortex? So here now we've cannulated naive animals and we put either oxytocin directly, uh, infuse it through the cannula into A1, or in our transgenic animals expressing channel rhodopsin, we put the fiber optic into the cannula and shine blue light over left auditory cortex. Uh, here's a movie uh, of one of these animals receiving optogenic stimulation. She's been co-housed only for about 12 hours now and even though she's got a fiber optic and left day one, you can see she's figured out how to retrieve pups, no problem. And so within this, this early time point of 12 to 18 hours into co-housing, animals receiving oxytocin, either exogenously or with endogenous release optogenically, about three quarters of them are retrieving at 12 to 18 hour time point, compared to the nominal slower retrieval rate, one out of three animals receiving saline in the left day one retrieving at that time point. Okay, so then what is oxytocin actually doing physiologically in left day one, perhaps to boost responses or amplify them in some way? Uh, well, before we get to that, just how does auditory cortex respond to pup call sounds? Um, and so this is one example of a pup call fragment. This is 500 milliseconds of time, um, and this is the frequency or uh, pitch of the sound on the y-axis. Pup calls tend to be in the high ultrasound range. Um, and they're emitted at this characteristic 
five hertz bout rate, you can see 200 milliseconds in between each of these whistles or so. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of the talk, uh, our work here is really inspired by uh, pioneering work by Robert Liu and, and by, by Adi. Uh, he's been working for a while on these things too. So um, uh, similar to what Adi's group does, uh, we make uh, wholesale and salt hash recordings and head fixed animals. Uh, here uh, is the schematic of the preparation. In this case, uh, in the earlier paper, everything was under uh, anesthesia. Uh, and some newer work I'll get to with imaging, uh, we've done things in awake head fixed animals. Uh, but here, the animals are anesthetized with isoflurane, head fixed, there's a craniotomy over left auditory cortex. And we've studied mother animals, either first with current clamp recordings or cell attached recordings to look at the action potentials evoked by pup call sounds. Here's one pup call fragment above the trial. So here are three trials in response to that pup call sound. You can see in mother animals, a number of spikes are evoked with a high tempo precision as to when the spikes are elicited. But in naive animals, there's a much weaker response to pup call sounds. Really on average, no, no real difference compared to baseline uh, spontaneous rates. But in virgin animals who've been co-housed, we verify, retrieve. Of course, then we see responses that look much more like the mothers. Uh, these aren't weird fat action potentials in the current clamp recording. These are big EPSPs with spikes riding on top of them. And I'd like to show this example because you can see even at the subthreshold membrane potential level, there's a high precision trial by trial as to when the synaptic events are being evoked. Uh, so is it really that this precise uh, spike timing uh, comes as a consequence of the pattern of synaptic input? Uh, well, to look at that, uh, here's the summary data. Uh, this is open published, so I'll skip over this. To look at the, the, the patterning of synaptic input a little bit more carefully, we've made voltage clamp recordings in vivo from these animals. And in voltage clamp, we can keep the cells at either the reversal potential for inhibition. And so if we play a sound like a pup call, we can measure the pattern of inward current of evoked excitation. And then in the same recording, maybe just on a different trial, we clamp up at the reversal potential for excitation around zero millivolts. And then in response to a pup call sound, we can measure the pattern of evoked uh, inhibition. And so by going back and forth, we can look over time at the general patterns of excitation and inhibition. You can't measure both e excitation and inhibition in the same cell in the same trial, but over time we can look at general averages in terms of the responses. <clears throat> so here's a response uh, in a mother animal, one of these voltage clamp recordings. Uh, each gray sweep is one trial, excitation here on the bottom, inhibition up top. And you can see the grand averages here in red, there's no input at all in this cell until the very end of the pup call sound. And then there's a huge amount of excitation followed by uh, an equally large amount of inhibition with a little bit of a time lag between the onset of excitation and inhibition. About a five millisecond lag here in this case. And this is exactly what would be required to reliably induce precisely one action potential on every trial before strong co-tuned inhibition rebounds or, or turn off the response back to baseline. So there's a high temporal correlation in the pattern of excitation and inhibition in the maternal animals. The virgin animals don't have action potentials in response to pup call sounds, not because they don't get input. They get synaptic inputs. They're just sort of poorly timed and kind of random from trial to trial, especially between excitation and inhibition. And in a lot of cells, it looks like there's sort of an ongoing amount of inhibition, maybe actively keeping these cells from firing spikes. But in animals, virgin animals who've been co-housed, we verify can retrieve. We see patterns of excitation and inhibition that are more matched. Inhibition comes more into phase within it with excitation. And so the temporal correlations are much higher. Again, we think enforcing reliable, uh, 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 robust spiking on every trial in response to pup call sounds. So it's not that uh, internal animals get more synaptic input. The total amount of input is about the same. It's just the temporal patterning, the organization and reliability, specifically of inhibition relative to excitation, is much higher in the retrieving animals than in the naive virgins. So then what is oxytocin doing um, maybe to promote a transformation from the less reliable virgin responses to the more reliable uh, maternal responses? Well, as I mentioned, oxytocin is a disinhibitory neuromodulator, right? It decreases the amplitude of evoked inhibition. 
And that's convenient uh, for two reasons. One, um, that might sort of amplify any incoming signal in the moment uh, during heightened oxytocin tone. But also disinhibition is an effective mechanism for uh, gating long-term synaptic modifications basically by opening a window for NMDA receptors to be activated, thus consolidating these changes and maybe rewiring the maternal brain uh, to respond to pup call sounds in the absence of need for oxytocin to keep modulating on every trial. So to test that hypothesis, we did what's essentially an LTP type of experiment by design, pairing experiment, pairing pup call sounds with oxytocin. The experiment's in three phases. We begin by uh, patching on to uh, layer 5 pyramidal cell in left female virgin auditory cortex. Play a pup call sound and measure the pattern of evoked excitation and inhibition. <clears throat> then pair that pup call with oxytocin, either exogenously or optogenically. And then keep recording for as long as we can after a few, you know, a uh, few minute pairing period where we stop applying oxytocin afterwards. There's one recording over about an hour uh, that uh, my former student Bianca made. Uh, here before pairing, you can see that there are synaptic inputs evoked um, into the cell, but they're fairly uncorrelated and, and fairly random. But then when she applies oxytocin, inhibition essentially goes flat. That happens really within the first 30 seconds to a minute. And then over the next few minutes, inhibition, excit I'm sorry, excitation begins to change. Excitation becomes much more reliable in this cell right here in the middle at this moment in time. And then she washes off oxytocin, basically drips saline onto the cortical surface of the craniotomy. Inhibition stays flat for about 15 minutes. Excitation remains reliable in this cell here. And then 45 minutes later, look what's going on with inhibition. It begins to recover, but then the temporal structure of inhibition looks much more like the temporal structure of excitation. So inhibition has become balanced, if you will, with the temporal pattern of the excitatory input of by the call. And this is just a summary of these changes, excitation and inhibition, um, <clears throat> and, a and a summary of changes in the temporal correlation as measured over multiple cells. Um, and the idea here is that basically, if we're playing pup call sounds and presenting oxytocin to the, the whole cortical surface, maybe many cells are going to be modified in a similar way. If we can't monitor synaptic strength over multiple cells uh, and compare cell one to cell two in that way, but if we are adjusting the temporal precision and the timing of events, maybe that change in, in patterning of synaptic input and thus spike output would be consistently modified cell for cell. That's why making repeated whole cell recordings in the same animal, in the same brain, um, maybe we can look at a, a change in timing over multiple cells over an extended period of time, over hours. And so that's exactly what we did here. So look at changes in spiking Here's one current clamp recording before, during, and after pairing with optogenic release of oxytocin. Oxytocin is disinhibitory, and that's why we get more spikes evoked by the pup call sound, but with less precision as to when they're evoked right away. But then three hours after pairing, Bianca recorded from a second spell. And now look, in response to this pup call sound, there's one precisely time spike on every trial. And so the change in spiking happens almost immediately due to the, the increase of excitation and the suppression of inhibition, which is the direct modulatory effect of oxytocin, we think. But that the change in spike timing is delayed, we think requiring a slower form of inhibitory plasticity to reorganize and adjust inhibitory inputs to enforce a precise spike timing, matching the new change in the pattern of excitation. Uh, recently, we, we began to look at this um, using two photon imaging to get a sense as to how the population of cells in left autofree cortex might respond to pop call sounds. And so this is the work of my graduate student, Jen Schiavo, using GCAP expression to do two photon imaging in awake head fixed animals. And Jen was interested in asking the question, uh, do individual cells, the population as a whole, respond essentially categorically to pop call sounds? Pop calls do have some variability, even the same animal, the same pup, there'll be some variability in terms of the spectrotemporal features in the particular pup calls it's emitting. Um, and yet the mother animal has to classify all of the sounds within a, a, a particular range as a pup call, a distress call for behavioral operation. Just like we have to recognize our names or the cries of our infants 
despite some variability in within some categorical boundary. So is there some form of statistical learning and at what level? So what Jen discovered is that in the superficial layers of auditory cortex, even in naive virgin females, there was some intrinsic tuning to the most exemplar stereotyped feature of pup calls, which isn't that they're ultrasonic. Actually, the, 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 the particular ultrasound frequency content, uh, most cells are pretty insensitive to. But what really was most important was the rhythm, that five hertz bout rate. Rate. And so she found that in the superficial layers of auditory cortex, here's one cell uh, in response to uh, this, what she's calling the standard USV at that five hertz rate. Some of these cells respond to that rate, but if we add spacers in between the little pup call whistles to make them longer or to make them shorter, the cells and the animals themselves don't respond to pup call sounds. In fact, the virgins can be trained per the lever to turn off pup call sounds specifically at this rate because they, they seem to find them uh, somewhat aversive. But animals have been co-housed. Here's a cell recorded in a retrieving virgin. You can see the cell itself has a broader range of responses to sort of fill the range of exposed pup call sounds because there is some deviation uh, in the, the rate at which pup calls are emitted. Sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're slower and retrieving animals respond within the, the full range of exposed calls. And there are cells in the auditory cortex that also seem to respond uh, within this broad range. And so the point here is that there does seem to be some initial scaffolding or hardwired tuning, uh, maybe similar to humans in which, you know, we all can hear baby cries and might even have some reaction to it. But our behaviors are different in dependent experience. And maybe this initial hardwiring allows for rapid plasticity to enable rapid maternal behavior. And sure enough, if she images excitatory cells and inhibitory cells over the course of co-housing, uh, we can kind of watch in real time as the excitatory cells and inhibitory cells become reorganized. There's initially a very sharp tuning that's down here in the left in the solid line of the excitatory cells. There's sort of a broad tuning of the inhibitory cells over the range of pup call intervals that she's presented in her library of different synthetic calls. And then this is a naive animal who's been co-housed for 24 hours. She's not retrieving yet, but you can see that the, the responses of the excitatory cells and the inhibitory cells have begun to become matched. And then on the very next time she tests retrieval, about 12 hours later, uh, you can see uh, they remain matched and they stay matched uh, a, a day later. So we think that rewiring of the auditory cortex is an initial bottleneck Essentially, right after that happens, the animals will start responding, retrieving behaviorally, uh, retrieving uh, pups uh, back to the nest. Okay, so to summarize um, the first uh, two thirds of the talk, really, uh, we've been looking at an unusual left lateralization uh, for maternal response to pup vocalizations at multiple levels. Left auditory cortex has more cells expressing oxytocin receptors. Left auditory cortex is required for responding to pup call sounds. Um, and there are responses to pup calls that are um, much more uh, robust and reliable in mother aud left auditory cortex compared to that in virgins or compared to right auditory cortex or males. There are responses in males, there are responses in right auditory cortex, but they really do seem to be qualitatively different in female left auditory cortex in experienced retrieving animals. And then we've been looking at the Really the, the cellular and synaptic action of oxytocin, how it might enable plasticity and help convert the less reliable virgin responses to the more reliable maternal responses. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to ask, when might oxytocin be released in uh, several days and a week of cutoff? The hearing experiment that I showed you compared a pup call with oxytocin and found that the less reliable responses became more reliable. Does it actually emulate anything that might happen during co-housing? Uh, you know, like, like I said back in the beginning of the talk, a lot of different compounds can lead to uh, changes in synaptic strength. That doesn't mean that they're, for example, the relevant endogenous neuromodulators that are activated during specific behavioral epochs. Um, in the biological mothers, it's a little bit more straightforward as to when oxytocin might be released. They're definitely nursing, and so there could be co-release of oxytocin through collaterals into the CNFs. But what about virgin females who aren't lactating? 
is there anything in their life, uh, especially when they become co-housed with a mother and pups, that might activate their oxytocin system? Or is it happening through, through other mechanisms? So to look at this, we basically begun making documentary movies of the, the maternal life of these animals. Um, because some social events can happen so quickly that if we're not recording everything, we might miss the most important event that can really dominate and transform social dynamics. You know, think about how interesting and complex human social behavior and interactions happen to be, right? If you miss an eye roll, if you miss one word someone utters, you might not understand the, in some cases, permanent change in uh, a social network uh, that that triggered. Um, and so instead of taking snapshots every half hour of, of behavior or such, uh, we've begun recording continuously with cameras. Uh, we now have multiple cameras on multiple cages. Um, but basically the idea here in the first set of studies is we wanted to just record continuously for the week of co-housing, taking a virgin female, putting her in a cage with mom with a pups. And you can see this virgin has an electrode in her brain. We want to record here from the oxytocin neurons to determine what about co-housing uh, might be activating them. Um, so we've made optically tagged recordings from oxytocin neurons. These, all these animals are oxytocin free animals, but now we're using channel rhodopsin not to elicit release of oxytocin throughout the brain, but we're putting a fiber optic down into the hypothalamus, a shining blue light, and any unit that responds to blue light in these animals is by definition an oxytocin neuron. And so here's one of our uh, successfully phototagged neurons, which find blue light, we got a nice PSTH. And so this unit being optically sensitive is an oxytocin releasing cell. Um, it turns out that putting our fiber optic on the electrode bundle in the hypothalamus uh, was a little too damaging to the animals. So we have to do two different implantations here. Electrodes down in, uh, normal to the surface, and coming in at an angle of fiber optic. We then use the small animal imaging core at NYU to use structural MRI images of unimplanted animals. Then we implant animals, make a CAT scan, and can register the location of the two implants with the, the structural image to verify that both implants are in the right location before beginning this, this sort of crazy week-long recording where we collect hundreds of hours of video and audio uh, per cage. And then we ask essentially, what is it in the video and audio that might be uh, correlated with spikes from the oxytocin neurons in the virgin females. And our surprise, it really wasn't interactions with pups that was activating oxytocin neurons. It was interactions with the mother. Here are two different units. Uh, this one being more sensitive to some kind of interaction with the mom. This one having a couple spikes in terms of an interaction with a pup. Um, and we have identified in the video three different interactions that seem to lead to uh, activity in virgin oxytocin neurons. Um, this is all hand scored, uh, but going forward now, uh, we're taking advantage of modern machine learning approaches to kind of automate uh, the, the analysis of hundreds now, thousands and tens of thousands of hours of continuous video. So for one, it seems that mothers keep the virgins in the nest, the behavior we're calling shepherding. It seems to activate oxytocin neurons. They chase the virgin into the nest. Mothers then seem to spontaneously generate retrieval trials in front of virgins who are in the nest and they will seem to watch and learn by visual observation. And then in some cases, the um, maternal animal will bring a pup to the naive virgin and leave it with her as if to encourage her to do something with the animal that then begins to emit vocalizations. So let me show you uh, uh, these three behaviors. Okay, so um, we score all kinds of different behaviors. Um, here I'm just showing you time in the nest versus time out of the nest fairly easy to store for the two animals who are co-housed, the virgin and the dam, along with the dam's pups. Every day at the red line, we test the virgin on issue retrieving pups or not as a nice proxy for acquisition of maternal behavior. You can see that time out of the nest in yellow, the mother is kind of in and out of the nest all four days. But look at the virgin, starting on day three, she's almost exclusively in the nest the entire time. And that's because the mother keeps her in there. Okay, I said this is a behavior we're calling shepherding, and I think you'll be able to see why. Now, here's the virgin. She just went to get a drink of water at a hydro pack. Here comes the mother to escort her back to the nest. Uh, did that the video play? Everybody saw that? So this isn't a subtle behavior. 
Um, this happens hundreds of times, um, uh, pretty much in every animal pair that we've looked at. Um, in those animals in which we've recorded from PVN units, including phototag units, the shepherding behavior activates oxytocin neurons and unidentified PVN neurons. Here are nine simultaneously recorded PVN units, including one phototagged oxytocin neuron, unit three. Uh, this isn't really a, a trial-based kind of behavior, right? This is just spontaneous behavior. But because it happens hundreds of times, dozens of times, even in a short period of time, which we can hold the same units, we can make PSTHs. And you can see that in gray, time zero is virgin head nest entry after being shepherded. Some of these ne neurons respond during the shepherding. Some of these neurons respond when the virgin's head enters the nest. And with our microphones, we know that the pups are calling a lot. And so this could lead to a kind of a natural pairing between release of oxytocin and pup call sounds. These neurons burst fire at around 10 or 20 hertz, which is exactly what's required to release the large dense core vesicles containing oxytocin. So now that the virgins are basically living in the nest, something else begins to happen. And then as the mother spontaneously retrieves pups in front of her, that's probably not on purpose. Here's the mother now. She comes out, she dropped off a pup, uh, an accident, the pup just fell off of her. She goes, picks up a pup. You can see the virgin is here in the nest. This maternal demonstration of retrieval also activates the virgin PVN and virgin oxytocin neurons. Here's one PSTH. This is a complex behavior, of course, that the mother is enacting, that the virgin uh, it, it seems to be watching. And so the activity in virgin PVN is sort of appropriately complicated. But when mothers retrieve pups, about half of the virgin oxytocin neurons we've recorded from, about 10 out of 21, increase their firing rate transiently during that period. Some of these are the same cells that responded to shepherding. Some of these are different cells. So there is some heterogeneity in the oxytocin population. Interestingly, some of these cells that respond to the mother retrieving also respond when the virgin herself retrieves. If we can record from them, if the virgin begins retrieving at an early enough time point, analogous to mirror neurons that have identified in primate motor cortex that respond to, to a monkey watching an act and then performing the act itself. But is it really the case that virgins are sitting there watching uh, other animals be maternal and learning by visual observation? Uh, and so to test that, um, we took non-co-housed virgin females and we just put them in the cage with the mother during, the te during testing of retrieval by the mother now. And that's easy, we take pups out of the nest and the mother will, will rapidly retrieve them. And then half an hour later or so, we test the virgin and ask, is she retrieving pups yet? And we do that once per day for about four days. Each testing is around uh, 10 trials. And so here are 15 animals. Uh, these are non-co-housed virgins. And you can see about half of them begin retrieving within about a day or two after the mother demonstrates retrieval. We worried that there might be some physical contact that could be promoting oxytocin release from the virgin. And so in other animals, we put a transparent barrier, a piece of plexiglass between the observer virgin and the demonstrator mother. Pup odor can pass through this. Uh, pup sound can pass through this. The animals can see each other. They just can't physically contact each other. And again, about half the animals begin retrieving uh, when they're uh, exposed to maternal retrieval from the other side of the barrier. But if we paint that barrier black, so there's no visual input, then only two out of 18 animals develop sensitivity to pup call sounds. The other 16 out of 18 animals didn't retrieve at all, indicating they are acquiring by visual observation uh, some enhancement in terms of their ability to retrieve pups. This depends on oxytocin, because if we go back to the transparent barrier and put an oxytocin receptor knockout mouse as the virgin observer, only a couple of those animals begin retrieving after visual observation, only a few, two, uh, two or three or so, compared to 50% uh, uh, of wild types. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is my last data slide. Uh, this is the third behavior we've discovered in the video. There's probably much more to find. As I said, we're now uh, collaborating with a number of groups like John Cunningham at Columbia, trying to uh, get into the modern age and use deep lab cut, other machine learning approaches to standardize and automate behavioral analysis to help us sort through dead time when animals are sleeping or grooming to look at unidentifiable periods that might be interesting social uh, uh, encounters 
that the neural networks haven't yet begun to classify. Uh, but in the very earliest days, um, this is how we did things. You can see it's formatted as an iPhone movie because that's what it is. Um, this is made by Bianca towards the end of her PhD in my lab. And usually when we're testing pup retrieval, we take the mom out of the nest because if the mother's in the nest, well, she'll retrieve the pup and that will thwart our ability to measure what the virgin's doing. But now and then Bianca left the mom in the cage and this is what happened. Here's the virgin in the left, upper left corner. She has a fiber optic in her head, uh, but she's only been in here for a couple hours and so she's not retrieving. There's a pup here in the lower left, but the mother also has gotten a pup in the lower right. The mother picks up the pup, but she doesn't go back to the nest. She goes to the virgin and leaves the pup with the virgin and then goes back herself. The virgin doesn't retrieve. The mother comes back a few seconds later, picks up the pup. So we found that pretty surprising. And that's why we began putting electrodes in the PDN and then trying to take this documentary approach to capture these events. So here's another animal, a different animal with electrodes in the PDN. And in this case, it took about two days before the mother animal engaged in this behavior. But in a 20 minute period of time, there were three different events by which the mother dropped the pup off in front of the virgin. On each of those occasions, the PVN neuron began bursting until the mother picked up the pup and terminated the bursting a few seconds later. And again, this might be exactly what's required to maybe promote this kind of plasticity. Uh, the pup call sounds maybe naturally pairing with the release of oxytocin uh, due to the actions the mother is taking uh, to promote oxytocin release in her, her co-housed partner. Okay, so to conclude, um, we've been examining oxytocin and various aspects of maternal care, um, trying to understand the action of oxytocin, um, uh, specifically in the auditory cortex, but elsewhere as well. And now trying to record also from oxytocin neurons during continuous monitoring of behavior. And our results suggest that at least some aspects of mouse maternal behavior aren't sort of fully innate and hardwired, uh, but can be learned and some aspects might even be learned by visual observation. I wanna thank everyone who's done this work. Uh, this is my team. The people in purple contributed to what I talked about today. Uh, Bianca Marlin really kickstarted all of this work, uh, doing the behavior and the recordings I showed you in the beginning. She now has her own lab at Columbia, opening uh, this spring, 2021. Uh, she's been a postdoc in the Axel lab. Uh, Mary Lamitra uh, was co-advised by Moses Chow uh, she's the one who made the receptor antibody um, and characterized the anatomy of the oxytocin circuitry. Iwana is the one who has been doing the long-term videography and the recordings of the oxytocin neurons, along with Luisa Schuster, a graduate student, Naomi Lopez, another graduate student. Iwana now has her own lab at Rutgers. And Jen Schiavo is the graduate student who did the two-photon imaging I described that was recently published a few weeks ago online in Nature. I want to thank my collaborators, uh, thank uh, my funding sources, and thank you for, for the invitation and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was amazing and uh, fascinating. Uh, so we'll move to the questions. So we'll start with questions for students. So any questions from students in the audience? Okay, so I guess we'll move to the faculty. So maybe I'll start with a question first. Uh, so I couldn't help noticing that uh, in one of your slides, there was a huge hotspot in the hippocampus. I guess it's CA2. Yep. So is anything known about the mechanism or the, if it's disinhibition in CA2 by oxytocin or anything else? Yeah, so we've been working with Dick Chen's lab a lot on that. Uh, Dick is really um, leading the, the project in the hippocampal formation, uh, also in collaboration with Yuri Musaki's lab. Um, CA2 is a hot spot for both uh, receptor expression as well as innervation of oxytocin fibers. In fact, you can use either marker, the oxytocin fiber innervation or the receptor expression as a way of demarking CA2 itself. Um, CA2 and CA1 are very different in terms of the responses to oxytocin modulation. And now we're trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the general principle and how is it working in, in many other brain areas? So for example, in the auditory cortex, um, there's a reduction in the amplitude of evoked iPSCs, similar to what we see in the 
the CA1 region. Um, and uh, Dick has a nice paper in Nature in 2013, Owen et al, showing that what oxytocin seems to be doing in CA1 is directly depolarizing fast spiking interneurons. And so application of the oxytocin receptor agonist TGOT depolarizes these cells and they begin releasing more transmitters spontaneously. So the spontaneous inhibitory tone goes up. What that does is it also depletes vesicles. And so when there's an evoked event, if you then shock the Sheffer collaterals, because there's a depletion of transmitter because of the increased spontaneous drive, there's a reduction in the evoked drive. And so there's a nice connection there between mechanisms of short-term plasticity and neuromodulation, and also uh, a, a cautionary tale for thinking about and trying to connect uh, spontaneous activity changes to evoked activity changes. Uh, sometimes they go together, but in this case, they're, they're opposite because they seem to be directly related. In the auditory cortex, we also see a reduction of evoked IPSC amplitude. Um, and we think it's by a similar mechanism, although we haven't fully worked out the details like, like Dick has and the Schaffer collaterals. But in CA2, it seems to work very differently. In CA2, the C2 pyramidal cells themselves express oxytocin receptors and are depolarized. There are sometimes slow ramp depolarizations over seconds, even minutes, then lead to burst firing in the, the CA2 region. So, um, you know, even neighboring areas, neighboring cell types uh, can have very different responses, um, but it seems to be due to, um, is it predominantly the inhibitory cells expressing the receptor or the excitatory cells expressing the receptor? Thank you. So, Rob, what would be the, the function of the, the hippocampus there in terms of uh, place, yeah, spatial location to the nest or something like that? Uh, that's, that's the idea. Um, there also could be some concert between CA2 and CA3. So uh, it does seem to be the case that CA2 uh, uh, primal cells, that CA2 as a region is sort of more sensitive to uh, social type of stimuli and social areas. Um, there have been reports of a nest cell tuning, um, uh, although I think it's pretty early days and kind of trying to fully understand uh, the, the social receptive fields of these cells. But there are some projections from CA2 to CA1. And so oxytocinergic modulation of CA2 kind of indirectly help promote plasticity also in, in CA1. Um, so I think you know, the, the evidence for uh, conjoint forms of modulation of plasticity is really strong in slices, but it's been trickier to get at in, in, in vivo yet. Without a doubt, though, there, there does seem to be more kind of a role for CA2 um, and oxytocin modulation in social recognition. Um, although, um, uh, aside from recordings of, uh, of units, um, the, the deep level mechanisms, I think, haven't been resolved for. I have a question about um, the EI balance results that you showed. Um, I, I love EI, EI balance uh, pretty much as much as anyone, but I wondered about the results. It seemed like the kind of first most striking change that seemed to happen kind of in both sets of results, both in terms of the timing and in terms of the tuning, was first to excitation. Like you had an increase in excitation, a kind of sharpening of the temporal precision of excitation, and then in the other example, a widening of excitation. Um, and that's, my interpretation would be in sort of secondary to that, is maybe the balancing of the inhibition to that. Um, but you have some way of separating the, the, the importance of first the changes that happen to excitation and then the role of the EI balance. So um, it's, it's complicated and um, multiphasic um, and we're still resolving the mechanisms here as well. Um, so we think that the very first thing that, that, that happens um, is a decrease in evoked inhibitory tone. Um, as I mentioned, we haven't yet taken the level that Dick has taken it to in the Schaffer collaterals. We don't have a full sense as to the kind of the earliest action on the inhibitory cells, and which are the relevant inhibitory cells that are being directly modulated. You know, not the, the inhibitory responses in slices at least don't go to zero, they go down by about a third or so. Um, but one interesting thing is those responses are recorded in pyramidal cells just randomly in a slice. 
and almost all pyramidal cells have some reduction in the inhibitory cell. Um, and so the inhibitory cells that express oxytocin receptors, presumably then, kind of have a, a wide number of contacts. Even in vivo, that response can drop within about, you know, really as, as, as early as we can begin to reliably measure statistically, 10 to 30 seconds. Um, and we, we do think that, that that is kind of the direct earliest action of oxytocin. Um, a drop in inhibition can lead to a quick indirect boost in excitation. And without a doubt, that then also leads to a, a, a fairly rapid form of NMDA receptor dependent LTP. Uh, we've looked at that in slices as well. We know that this disinhibition does in fact uh, lead to an NMDA receptor dependent uh, change in the excitatory strength, making it stronger. That change in, in excitation, uh, which is a consequence of neuromodulation, but we don't think the direct action of neuromodulation um, can be expressed within minutes. And then the inhibitory responses first have to recover from being reduced by the neuromodulator. And we think that's dependent on one, the removal of oxytocin from the extracellular space where it would continue to act on oxytocin receptors as long as they're not being fully internalized. Um, we then would have to have uh, a recovery from say vesicle depletion, if it is the case that the inhibitory cells are, are spontaneously active and dumping transmitter. Um, that would re 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 uh, basically return the inhibitory strength back to baseline. Um, but there are forms of inhibitory plasticity that do seem to connect to earlier forms of excitatory plasticity. Uh, we looked at this even in, in whole cell recordings induced by spike timing dependent methods. If we pair uh, stimulation in a brain slice, which would evoke some pattern of excitation and inhibition, we pair that with a postsynaptic action potential repetitively, a la SDP. We see long-term changes in EPFCs and also long-term changes in IPFCs um, that were specifically paired uh, with the back with the, with the postsynaptic spike. Um, and so basically then putting it all together, there's a recovery from neuromodulation and then a slope and then a, a, a form of inhibitory plasticity that might be slow because it depends on that recovery from neuromodulation, but also might just take a little while um, if there are other excitatory changes that are happening um, kind of throughout the circuit, right? Some changes that are maybe triggered early can lead to other changes indirectly because excitatory plasticity is a positive feedback kind of process. And so the inhibitory inputs might then have to kind of catch up. Um, but we think that inhibitory uh, uh, balancing or specific strengthening where excitation got stronger has to happen fairly quickly to control the new change in excitation. It has to be fairly specific. It's not some kind of homeostatic thing that's elevating all of inhibition, um, but it's dependent on you know, what, what specific inputs were activated um, during the initial uh, modulation event. Uh, so the short of it is uh, there are probably at least three or four different identifiable mechanistic components um, uh, and um, one of the most interesting aspects of this is an NMDA receptor dependent form of inhibitory plasticity that strengthens inhibition in relation to the excitatory, the NMDA receptor activation that uh, it occurred with. Any more questions? If not, then uh, thank you very much, Robert. And see you all in the next seminar next week. Thank you, everybody.